Hello everyone and welcome to the new video. Today we have an interesting puzzle to solve. We are going to implement BrainFuck Interpreter. If you ask yourself why should you continue watching this video, there are at least two reasons to do so in my opinion. Firstly, you are going to experience something unusual. If you work as a software developer, you don't implement esoteric language interpreters on a daily basis. And secondly, I will show you not a very common way how to implement this interpreter. Instead of using an imperative approach with a mutable state, I will show you how to solve this puzzle using recursive functions and immutable data structures. I strongly believe that you will get 1% smarter after watching this video. There are several exciting things to learn today, and we are starting right now. Before we start implementing BrainFuck Interpreter, let's learn more about its syntax by example. The easiest way to understand what each instruction does is actually to see it in action. Here on the right side you can find a list of all instructions with a short explanation. Aside from these instructions, BrainFuck Interpreter consists of Instruction Pointer, Memory Block, Data Pointer, Optional Input and Output. And now let's take a look what this simple program does. It increments the current byte 4 times, then it decrements 3 times, and the final value gets copied to the output, and the program finishes. The second program explains how we can move the data pointer inside memory block. The first instruction of that program increments data pointer, so now it points to the second cell of the memory block. If we increment the value 4 times, we will increment the second cell of that memory block. Now we can move the pointer again and increment 3 times third cell of that memory block. We can also move back and then we can decrement the value. If we copy it to the output, we will use the current value at the data pointer. We can move back to the first cell of the memory block, increment 2 times and copy the value to the output and program finishes. The third program explains how to read bytes from the input. The first operation of that program reads the first byte of the input and moves that byte to the memory block at the current data pointer. Now we can increment the current value two times and we can copy it to the output. Next we can move the pointer, we can read the next byte from the input, increment it two times and copy it to the output. We repeat the same operation and we copy the last value to the output. The last program explains how you can implement the while loop. It starts with incrementing the first cell in the memory two times, and then we go to the conditional jump instruction. The opening square bracket checks what is the value at the current data pointer in memory. If this is zero, it jumps to the next operation after enclosing square bracket. Otherwise, it moves to the next instruction. And this is what happens here, because the value is 2, we are moving to the next instruction. This instruction moves data pointer to the next cell, we increment 2 times and we copy it to the output. Then we get back to the first cell, we decrement the value, and here we are reaching the, en the enclosing square bracket. This instruction also checks what is the value in the memory at the current data pointer. If it's a 0, it moves to the next instruction, Otherwise, it jumps back to the next instruction after opening square bracket. And this is what happens here. The, value, the current value is 1, so we need to jump to the next instruction after the opening bracket. This instruction moves the data pointer again to the second cell. We increment the value two times, we copy it to the output, we get back to the first cell, we decrement the value, and we reach the enclosing square bracket again. This time, the current value is 0, so the loop is ended and we move to the next instruction. It moves data pointer to the right, we increment the value, we copy it to the output, and the program terminates. Now when we know how the BrainFuck interpreter works, we can start implementing our own one. Here I have Gradle project, we have a BrainFuck class where we put our implementation, and we also have BrainFuck unit test. Uh, if I run this test right now, it will fail because there is no implementation. Here I'm using Groovy 3.0 and the latest Spock for those unit tests. This source code is available on GitHub. There is a link in the description below. You can clone it and play around with it. Let's start implementing the interpreter to pass this first test. Here we use the simplest possible program. 
the program that uses the dot instruction to copy byte zero to the output. Let's go to the BrainFuck class and let's start implementing it. I'm going to implement this interpreter using recursive function. Let's define step function. This function will represent a single instruction execution of our interpreter. It will take some parameters. The first one is instruction pointer. The second one is the data pointer. It will also take um, some memory. This is a class we are going to implement in just a second. And let's play with types so we can represent input as a dedicated type, as well as output. It also might be a dedicated type as well. Okay, now let's implement those types. I will use static classes here. static input and output so at least here we are okay and now the process function this is our public api function it will call step with instruction pointer zero, data point pointer zero. It will use empty memory. It will create input from the string pa passed to this function. And it will use empty output as well. So now let's implement those methods. Just return new memory. Here we can add with a constructor. So let's create this, some empty output, okay, so here we have our types defined. And here is our step function. Because this method is recursive, we need to define termination condition. In our case, if instruction pointer goes beyond the program, then we are going to return the output text, okay? Otherwise, we will check what the instruction at the current instruction pointer is. For that, we can use switch and we can use character at instruction pointer and here we can implement cases for our interpreter. Let's define the default one maybe. So the default case is that we always increment the instruction pointer and we pass other objects as is. For this first test, we need to implement the dot operation. What it does is it takes the current value at the data pointer, the current byte, and it copies it to the output. So we can implement it in the following way. Data, data pointer remains the same. Memory is not changed. Input is not changed, but the output we need to append memory read at the data pointer, okay? So we will need to implement those two methods. And because we want to use immutable data structures, this append operation will create a new output object and it will return it. So we are not going to modify the state of this output object, okay? 
we can get character here. So what this append method does is it returns new output by appending character to the current text, okay? So the append operation is implemented and now we need some read operation from our memory. Let's say we will read characters, it can be end, okay? And let's just return zero, okay? Let's run the test and see if the first test case is satisfied. Voila, it is, even though our memory implementation is very naive and it doesn't, and it always returns zero, but for the first test, it's okay. Let's take a look at the second test case. This program increments the value at the current data pointer four times and it copies it to the output, okay? So we need to implement plus instruction. What happens is we always increment instruction pointer. Data pointer remains the same, but on memory we need to call increment current data pointer. Input remains the same as well as output, okay? And here we need to implement increment memory at the given data pointer. And because we want to use immutable data structures, increment operation won't change the internal state of the memory, but instead it will create a new object that represents this increment change, okay? We need to decide how we are going to store internally those changes and those values. And let's say for this demo, we will use a concurrent map, okay? So we will create a concurrent map for simplicity. At this moment, we can use a map of integers. This is probably too much because we are only interested in values from zero to 255. An integer is, is much larger, but premature optimization is root of all evil and we will optimize it later on. Let's create a constructor that takes any map and it will create new concurrent hash map from a given map, okay? So here we can create a memory, empty memory from an empty map. And now what the increment memory implementation may, may look like. So let's take a copy of that map and we can copy storage like that and we will return a new memory from that copy, okay? And how to increment the value? We can use compute function at the given index. This compute function for a given key, it runs some two arguments function using the key and a value. So I can pass a closure here and increment operation may be represented as the following code. So we take value or zero if it's null and we just add one to it, okay? And now read operation may return storage, get or default index or zero. Let's run the test and let's see if it works. Uh, of course not because we need to do a char here and now we can see that the second test passed. Now it's time to implement decrement value operation represented by the minus symbol so we can go back to our brain fuck interpreter and here we can add another case we always increment instruction pointer, data pointer remains the same. And on memory, we will call decrement data pointer input output as is. And this decrement function will return a new memory index here. And what we can do, we can just copy this here 
Of course, we could extract and refactor this code, but we can do it later. Now let's just run and see if the program works as expected. Yes, the third test case now passes. In the fourth test, we use data pointer increment instruction. So let's implement it. This one should be fairly simple. Let's add it here. So what this, it just increments data pointer and other things remains the same. We can run the tests again and see if it passes. It does. And now we can implement also decrementing data pointer operation, which is also very simple to implement because now we need to remove a step that decrements data pointer and it passes all other structures without any changes. Now we run tests, we can see that even this program passes now, but there is one test that still fails. And this is the test where we check if the unsigned byte overflow is implemented correctly. BrainFact by design allows us to store unsigned bytes in the memory. So every value is between 0 to 255. Java and Tus Groovy don't have unsigned byte primitive type. We used integer in our memory implementation and that is why this program ended up with storing probably minus two uh, in the memory instead of 254. We need to fix this and uh, for this thing we can change the type to byte here and it will require some small improvements to our memory implementation. First of all, we need to remember that byte stores the value between minus 128 to positive 127. So we will need to apply some manual shifts to cover values between 0 to 255. So whenever we need to read a value from our memory, what we will do is here we will return byte minimum value if it's not set and we will move we will shift it 128 so if it's minus 128 we will return zero as expected and if it's 127 the byte max value we will return 255 as expected and we also need to modify increment and decrement operations here so instead of returning zero, we will return byte mean value and we will store it as byte. The same thing happens here. And we also use it as byte. So internally, we will store every values using byte primitive type. But whenever we read the value, we will use this shift with 128. So we always return values from the range from 0 to 255. Let's run the tests and see if this test passes. Yes, and now we can see that the program produced expected output. The next test that fails takes bytes from the input. So we need to implement this operation in our interpreter. Let's get back to our step function and here we can implement the instruction the in increment instruction pointer data pointers remain the same and now we need to write memory at given data pointer and we will take input head then we will return input tail and output without applying any changes. So what this instruction does in our case, we will read the first byte 
from the input. We will write it to the memory and we will continue with the tail of that input. So the, the input without the first byte. Let's implement those methods here. When it comes to head, we can return string take one. We can call to character and scar. This is how the head method, head method can be implemented. The tail method is also very simple. So we will create a new input by calling string drop one and write operation. We'll create a new memory, of course. We can use index. We can use character here as well. So again, we need to do some small copy paste here. And now we need to remember that the value that we want to store in the memory is actually represented by unsigned byte. So to write it correctly in our memory, we will need to shift left this value by 128. We'll use just regular put, up, put method, a given index. We will put value minus 128 stored as byte. Okay, that's the whole story here. And we can see that this test passes now. Now we need to implement remaining two instructions. Uh, those in jump instructions that allow us to implement simple loop. Let's go back to brainfuck here. As we remember, this opening square bracket defines the start of the loop. And we need to detect if the program should continue running to the next instruction or should it jump to the first instruction after enclosing square bracket. So let's uh, do the following. We will read the current byte in the memory and if it's equals zero, then we will jump forward from the current instruction pointer and otherwise we are just continue to the next instruction. So we will do this, jump, data pointer, memory, input and output. We need to implement this jump forward method. And here we need to be smart enough to detect what is the index of my enclosing square bracket. Uh, and for that, we need to remember that every loop may contain a nested loop. So let's use this variable seek. So while seek is greater than zero, we will be looking for the correct enclosing square bracket. Okay. So we move our instruction pointer forward. And what we are looking for is if we find opening square bracket, I'm going to increment seek. And if I find the enclosing square bracket, I am decrementing seek, right? So in the best case scenario, if there is no opening square bracket, my function, this while loop ends after finding the first enclosing square bracket. And in this case, I can just return instruction pointer plus one because I'm interested in the next instruction that happens after this enclosing square bracket. The similar situation happens to this instruction. So we also need to detect what's the expected jump. And in this case, we will read the memory. And if the current byte in the memory is greater than zero, we will jump back from the current instruction pointer and otherwise we will continue running to the next instruction. Now we need to implement this jump back method and we will do similar implementation here. So 
while seek is greater than zero, we are going to check instructions before this enclosing square bracket and we will search as long as and we will continue as long as we don't find correct opening square bracket. So if we find enclosing square bracket, we are incrementing seek. And if we find opening square bracket, we are decrementing seek. And we are returning instruction pointer plus one. Again, in the best case scenario, there won't be any enclosing square brackets and the first opening square bracket actually terminates this while loop and we th th this way we find the instruction pointer of the first instruction that happens after this opening square bracket. And now when we run all those tests, we should satisfy all remaining test cases. So this program with loops now gets interpreted correctly. Hello world from the Wikipedia page also produces the expected output. And here are three tests taken from the code words exercise. The one that accepts input until specific character here. And this one also accepts input until specific character, this time character zero. This uh, works as well. And uh, here is a program that multiplies two bytes from the input and produces the output that is the result of multiplication of these two numbers. This one works as well. We are almost done, but there is one last thing that we need to take care of. Let's get back to interpreter class implementation uh, and to this recursive step method. Let me explain one thing. Here we used tail recursive calls. Tail recursion is a specific type of recursion where recursive call happens at the end of the function and the function that makes recursive call does not wait for any result from this recursive call, right? So for instance here, when we call this step method for any instruction, we are not waiting for any result and actually all values are calculated at the moment when we do this recursive call, right? We would have to deal with a traditional recursion if, for instance, I had white space in the string and if I wait for the result from the recursive call, right? So like in this case, I cannot tell you what is the value of this white space in front of the result because I need to wait for this result, right? In this case, keeping every stack frame in the memory makes sense because I need to terminate the recursive call. I need to collect all intermediate results and then I will get back to this stack frame that made this specific traditional recursive call so I can actually tell you what the result is. In tail recursive, there is no need for keeping every stack frame in the memory because we are not waiting for any result. Unfortunately, JVM doesn't offer any optimizations for tail recursive calls and uh, even though nothing waits for the result from the recursive call, JVM still keeps every stack frame in the memory. And if we make too many recursive calls, it will end up with stack overflow error. Groovy offers one solution to this problem and this is tail recursive annotation. If we implement a tail recursive recursion, we can add tail recursive annotation to such method. And what Groovy compiler does in this case is it will transform the, byte, the generated bytecode into imperative while loop operation. Let me show you it by example. Let's comment out that is tail recursive here and let's go to terminal and I will just compile brainfuck groovy class as is right now, okay? We can open the class file which contains the bytecode and with IntelliJ we can simply decompile it. If we scroll to this step method here, here you can see that this is a regular a tail recursive call, right? We have step function, here we have our ter termination condition, and here we have 
tail recursive calls as usual, right? And now let's see what happens if we compile the same class, but this time with tail recursive added to this method, okay? Let's do this. And now we can reopen the class file and decompile it to the Java code. And let's see what, what does it look like. Now this step method, as you can see here, there are no recursive calls inside. And instead, it uses a while loop, right? Of course, this approach has one significant advantage. It allows us to implement our business logic using a pure tail recursive calls, but the compiler handles all these optimizations for us, right? However, if you attach a debugger to the code that uses tail recursive annotation, you need to be aware of that the bytecode that debugger sees is completely different than the source code you see in your IDE. So you will see in a debugger those auto-generated variables, for instance, and there will be this while loop instead of recursive method calls. And now let's just do one last thing. I mentioned in the beginning that uh, this project uses Gradle. I added Gradle Shadow plugin, and this plugin allows us to create a single jar that can be executed as a regular Java program. So we can call Gradle, let's do Gradle clean, and then we can call Gradle Shadow jar to create just a single jar file and we will run our BrainFuck interpreter as regular Java program, okay? And now we can do Java minus jar, build leaps, groovy BrainFuck all jar, and let's copy this hello world program, okay? Add it here, let's run it, and we can see it printed hello world to the console, I guess if we copy this program, we should get this nice smile on the console as well. If you're interested in source code, there is a link to GitHub repository in the description below. You may want to implement your own BrainFuck interpreter in Groovy, and if so, you can at least use the same unit tests I used in today's video. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button, watch the next video from my channel, and tell me what your favorite programming exercise is. If you would like to support my efforts in creating those entertaining and educational videos, check the link in the description. I wrote down six different ways how to support my blog and YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.